Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, you're very welcome to QPS Talk Time. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here with you today. Um, we are just having a little technical difficulty at the moment with one of our uh, groups of speakers, um, and so we're going to try and, and uh, continue to get them to join, and they may join us on the telephone, uh, but we're very fortunate to have two uh, of our other groups here with us. So, yeah, so so same as ever, if you've joined us before, um, uh, obviously, unfortunately, people can't speak with us directly, but you can use the chat, and we really will encourage you to use the chat both to respond to some of the things that speakers are saying, but also to ask questions and, and share kind of any comments or insights you're having. Um, if you're uh, having difficulty with your audio, you can dial in and there are some phone numbers there uh, and uh, an event number that will allow you to listen into the audio. Uh, please feel free to tweet and we'd encourage you to tweet and there's, tweet and there's some uh, Twitter handles there uh, that you can tag or use. Um, and uh, at the end of the session, we'll send you a, a short uh, feedback form, and we really do encourage people, please, to to use that and to feedback uh, your ideas and your thoughts, because we try and, and take them on board, and that's how we uh, design uh, next year's programme, which we're getting stuck into now. Um, and then you'll also get an email at the end of the um, uh, the session, just confirming your attendance for, for, uh, for CPD uh, purposes. So, as ever, we'd just like you to uh, uh, use the chat box to tell us where you're coming from today, uh, who's there, uh, especially if you're in a group. Um, and um, we'd like you to maybe finish this statement, you know, which is the theme really for today, which is about uh, quality improvement learning. So, quality improvement learning helped me by dot, dot, dot. So, um, what are your thoughts there? What what has quality improvement ever done for you, uh, in terms of of an approach uh, to getting things uh, done or making things better? So, uh, like I said, we're very fortunate today uh, to have uh, speakers from from all around the country, um, and and I hope we'll get to to bring you all our speakers. Um, and so, uh, just to run through the the, the list, there we have Alison McCaffrey and uh, Marisa Connolly, and uh, hopefully. Uh, Shortly, Professor Clodor Gorman uh, may join from the uh, uh, children's diabetes team in Limerick. Um, I'm hoping we're going to be joined shortly again by uh, Stephen Monks uh, uh, and Don Murray, Don Murray and Andy Kelly from the Community uh, Forensic Mental Health Team in Dublin. And uh, we are also fortunate to be joined by Rosemary Roach, uh, uh, who is a senior diabetes podiatrist uh, in uh, Roscommon. So we've we've covered all corners of the country today, and uh, and I think that 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 is uh, uh, important because it shows I think the adaptability of quality improvement uh, as as a way of of uh, solving problems and improving things. So so what we're what we're doing today is we're, you know we have three teams here who've just recently completed the uh, uh, the diploma in leadership and quality, and I've had the privilege to uh, to teach on that, and we're now the Postgraduate Certificate in Quality Improvement and uh, Leadership in Healthcare. Um, but uh, we, we picked today's presentations both, you know, for their diversity coming from different corners of the uh, the country and, and different specialist uh, interests and, and expertise, but also for, uh, you know, we, we really thought they were great examples of, of quality improvement being put uh, to use to, uh, to improve complex problems. Uh, and so it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Alison and Marisa here today uh, for them to share uh, a little bit about what they did in uh, their diabetes clinic in Limerick. So uh, over to you folks. So uh, greetings from the Department of Pediatrics in the University Hospital in Limerick. We're delighted to be here today to present our QI project. Um, my name is Alison McCaffrey. I'm an AMP in paediatric diabetes. I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Marisa Connolly, senior clinical psychologist. And we hope to also have um, Professor Claude Gorman join us, our consultant paediatrician. So um, our QI project was introducing agenda setting in adolescents with type 1 diabetes. And we felt that we had a diverse range of experience between us, between nursing, psychology, and medicine. So we worked to our strengths and used our uh, skill sets, which really complemented each other along our QI journey. So our contexts and aims then. So our initial aim was quite ambitious. We planned to develop an evidence-based uh, person-centered transition pathway for the child or young person with type 1 diabetes, moving from the pediatric setting to the adult diabetes setting. 
And when we looked further into this, we could see the value of uh, self-management. And so we started to hone it down into improving self-management and quality of life for the child or young person with type 1 diabetes through collaboration and co-production. So we actually started to look at what mattered most to the young person and how we could best facilitate their health. Um, in, and then in order to develop this co-production, we decided to introduce agenda setting as part of their outpatient consultation. So our smart aim, uh, I suppose, um, was in conclusion was to introduce the agenda setting tool to all of our service users who were over the age of 12 attending our paediatric diabetes outpatient clinic. Um, and with the hope that we'd have over 60% actively setting their own agenda by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. So where to start then? So I suppose when we looked at where we wrote our model of it for improvement framework and our QI methods, we started by mapping the patient journey. And while we mapped the entire patient journey from diagnosis to transition to the adult service, we uh, we honed in on the clinic process where we could, I suppose, use time more effectively, use their waiting time more effectively. So we decided that if we were going to um, introduce this agenda setting tool, that the outpatient setting would be the most effective place um, to distribute it initially. Um, uh, we also used our fishbone diagram and our entire team took part in this kind of uh, looking for cause and effect and brainstorming so we could see, we could sort through our ideas and see how different people problem solved in a different way. So we were looking at our problem um, under the six P's and we felt the more people that we involved in this process, the more um, kind of diverse range of solutions we were, we were kind of starting to um, discover. We then proceeded to um, draft our driver diagram. And this was the first of three drafts. And they, they all, I suppose, they evolved over the, the duration of our project. So this would be our final draft. And we were looking to for our theory of change and to, to, to build a hypothesis and to test us. So we were looking to uh, introduce teenage agenda setting. And that's what we wanted to achieve. Um, how we were going to do it then and why did we want to do it? And the idea was to um, uh, decrease diabetes distress, improve adherence and engage our teen cohort and how we were going, what actions we could take then would be, I suppose we were looking at our own, um, our own communication skills, nonverbal, our language and what, how our language is uh, interpreted and um, how we could work together and ask the young person and their families what mattered most to them. And now I'm going to hand you over to Marisa. Okay, so then I suppose our next steps really were to introduce and test um, our agenda setting tool um, and start our PDSA cycle. So you can see on the screen there, we started with a pretty simple Word document in December 21. Um, and it just had, what would you like to speak about today? And then some examples that we thought might be relevant. Um, Alison distributed them to um, eligible young people at the clinics. And uh, I suppose our prediction was that we were hoping young people would engage with it and tell us a little bit about what mattered to them in terms of their self-management and quality of life. So we were pleased to see that we had 50% uh, completion rate in our first um, go. Um, already we got really important information back from staff and young people about what we could add to the tool, which was really encouraging. So um, after a positive start, then things went a little bit downhill for the next two weeks. And we, we noted that we didn't have any uh, agendas um, completed, which was a little bit disappointing, but actually it turned out to be a really important part of our learning process because it meant we needed to go back and look at the process. So what we discovered is when Alison was out sick um, from the clinics, young people weren't actually getting access to the agenda setting tool. So we decided to introduce our agenda setting as part of routine care. So young people coming to the um, diabetes clinic typically um, undergo a weight, height and A1C blood check with a clinic nurse as part of their routine care. So we figured if we introduce the agenda setting tool at that stage, we'd be more likely to get young people maybe to complete the tool. And I suppose very importantly, we saw that as a symbolic opportunity that actually what we were saying to young people now is, you know, your voice matters as much as your as your blood work. So I think that was a really important change um, throughout. And then I suppose to further PDSAs, we modified the tool. We started to include ideas that young people were giving us that we hadn't thought about, things that staff were saying to us. We increased the awareness raising of agenda setting by putting posters in the clinic. And we had some um, staff desk reminders as a prompt to engage in the tool. We had discussion of the agenda setting tool in the post clinic um, meeting as a means of, I suppose, increasing buy in and trying to embed and establish the agenda setting as part of the culture. And we were pleased to see that we were starting to get up on 60 to 80% of our agenda setting um, completed at that stage. 
So I suppose that was all very encouraging. And then we kind of had a pretty major kind of PDSA change. I suppose what we wanted to do at that stage was maybe encourage more collaboration in the work. So what we were beginning to see is we had young people, you know, using the tool, we had staff, but we really wanted to work on that collaborative piece and the kind of shared decision making between young people and staff. Um, and we also wanted to get some feedback on the process from young people as to uh, how they felt about it. So what we did in terms of um, encouraging that collaboration, we made a few key um, changes, I suppose, to our um, tools. So up on the left hand side, we started with the language. So we changed it from agenda setting to your diabetes consult working together. And then underneath that, for the topics of discussion, we included a section for the young person to select and for the clinician to select. And we also included, included a section on goals so that we could kind of have some actions at the end and um, that would hopefully happen as part of this shared decision making process. And we also included a feedback tool um, and that feedback tool, we hoped young people would complete and give to us before they left the clinic to tell us a little bit about how they found their consultation. And that tool is actually a validated tool um, by Elwyn, which is a patient, I suppose, um, it's a self-report measure of shared decision making and satisfaction with consultation. And we just sticked it up a little bit, we felt, uh, for our younger population. And I suppose our prediction really in, in making these changes was that this would provide a nice template, which would really encourage a little bit more collaboration in the work. So then just very briefly, I suppose what we were finding over the next coming weeks, we were really pleased to see that the young people were predominantly reporting positive experiences with the agenda setting tool and, and of their experience in care. So in terms of the three feedback questions to help me understand my health, to listen and to plan my next actions, they seem to suggest that a lot of effort or every effort was being made. Um, we were having we were seeing an increase in the amount of agendas being completed. Um, and also we were getting a high rate of feedback. So as a further PDSA, then what we decided to do was maybe share this feedback with our service users. So we had a teen and parent information education night on diabetes, and we had a section on agenda setting called Your Voice Matters. And basically we, we let them see, this is what you've told us so far is important to you. We take this very seriously, and this is how it's informing your service provision. And I suppose we also took the opportunity maybe to share some of that positive feedback with staff, which was also a really important move because I'm sure as you're aware, sometimes in clinic, what we tend to focus on is what we're not doing so well or where the problems are. So I suppose we, we saw this as an opportunity to catch the good and also that maybe if staff saw value in the process of agenda setting, that they might be more inclined to, to use the tool. So I suppose our main outcomes and learnings were that our primary and secondary outcome measures were uh, suggesting that agenda setting seems a feasible, acceptable, useful uh, for the child young person uh, with type 1 diabetes. Um, the percentage of agenda setting uh, completed was consistently over 60%, which was very good. And uh, feedback on the process was positive and recommendations for the agenda setting tool to be retained in the adult service uh, were noted in the last transition clinic where we had, uh, I suppose, tweaked our agenda setting tool for the final PD pediatric clinic and we found that a lot of the young people um, were actually I would say eager to use it as part of their young adult uh, clinic when they moved to the new setting and they felt it might be a useful communication tool when they meet a new team that they're not familiar with. Um, qualitative feedback from the wider team was very positive. We met a lot of NCHDs that found it very useful um, when they're coming on their rotation for three to six months to guide their uh, consultation with the young person and to open the the lines of communication. Um, we found there was a, a notable culture shift um, from what we've always done. And so we, we felt that yeah. this was very... Yeah, and I suppose like a dynamic yeah. shift almost. Um, I think it was hard to maybe quantify, but it was very palpable. And I think maybe a move away from a purely medical model to maybe a more holistic kind of person-centered um, care model where it was less of the doing to, yeah. doing for, to the doing, doing with. with. Exactly. And it has enabled us to gain tangible uh, information about self-management issues uh, to inform ser service development. And we saw that the recurrent would say um, frequency of exercise or sleep or stress or um, was feeding into our service development. So we organized a, a young person's activity day mm -hmm. and we had um, an, an exercise education session where they were able to implement, implement the um, information that they had received in their education session then and uh, put it to use during their exercise and activity day. So I think it's important to note that um, I think the biggest thing we learned was that the small, simple um, steps of a PDSA really are very valuable and that even small tweaks and changes you make to your practice have a big impact in the service 
Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the structure of the PDSA and it allowed us to be able to very quickly figure out what was working, what wasn't to roll with it. Yeah. And I suppose that we, we kind of start out with this idea of everything. We had to have the perfect idea, but actually by trusting the process and trusting that, you know, our families and young people were experts by experience, it kind of almost the co-production happened. The yeah. agenda setting too kind of wrote itself. So that was... I remember the first PDSA we did was um, I felt that uh, I couldn't believe something so small and simple. Was, was so was so effective. So yeah, I remember yeah. being getting very re, much reassured by that actually. At yeah, first. and starting somewhere. So that was really yeah. and maybe just the importance of reflection as well. I think in a hospital environment, sometimes we're so busy with the doing that just I think what maybe we learned forget is to as look a team, back. Yeah. you know, st standing back a little bit and, and reflecting is so important as well on, on what we're doing. Yeah, and just yeah. this is just like a, I suppose, a visual of our journey. So I think this was um, when we were making our video on the left. And I think this was our graduation then only recently in the last week. And it's just nice to, to look back and see um, that a lot happened in the year, but we're very, we're very happy that we completed it, actually. Yeah. And I think fun and playfulness as well and creativity. Um, and, and creativity. Yeah. I think that just allowed us to get into a space as team members to know each other in a slightly different way. And I think there's huge value in that um, and a lot of value for the project. And maybe just to say a special thanks Thank to you. our young people and families as well for their participation in, in showing us the way. And John and Peter as well for all their guidance. Oh, not at all, guys. It was a real pleasure. And uh, you should be so proud of that. I, mean, I think it's a really fabulous, um, fabulous project. And I think so much learning. And I think we'll we'll come back um, uh, at the end and maybe try and, and have some questions because I'm sure the, uh, the, uh, the audience will have some questions as well. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to do a quick shout out just to Stephen. Stephen, can you hear us there and Andy and, and Anne? Yes, we can hear you. Uh -oh. Can you hear us? We can hear you loud and clear. It's good Hello. to hear you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Stephen, we can bring your slides up here if you and the team are happy for us to do that. Yes, please. Yeah, so the first slide should just be a picture of our ugly mug. Yeah, that, it's that, there. That. Yeah, yeah. You're all looking good. We're looking good. That motley crew is myself, uh, Steve Monks, and Anza Murray and Andy Kelly. So I shall proceed just to, to give you a brief overview. Thank you, John, for inviting us to, to talk time. It's our pleasure to be able to, to talk about our QI project. Uh, to explain the context, which is very important, we're, we're a community mental health team attached to the National Forensic Mental Health Service based in Dublin City Centre. We look after patients who have been found not guilty by reason of insanity at trial in the criminal court. So this is usually for serious violence offences. And these patients have then progressed through the inpatient care pathway at the Central Mental Hospital to a supported community placement. Patients under our care are generally uh, those with complex mental health needs, and that's related to severe and enduring mental illness, predominantly schizophrenia as well as substance abuse problems and histories of, of serious violence. Progression through the inpatient program is a process which takes about five years on average and then discharge from the central mental hospital is then subject to conditions of treatment and supervision, which is set by an independent statutory body called the Mental Health Review Board. So the majority of our community patients are in remission from acute mental illness and have progressed to a more advanced stage of mental health recovery. We operate a system of case management whereby each patient is assigned a community key worker who coordinates care and supervision in collaboration with the patient, the MDT and other agencies. And key workers tend to work with the patient over long periods. And this relationship in itself represents a crucial driver of service provision and risk management processes within our organization. So I just want to tell you very briefly about our QI project, what we did and why we did it. So as a mental health service, our regulating body, the Mental Health Commission, sets a standard that each mental health service user should have an individualized care plan document and that the concept of recovery should form the basis of its construct. So we identified recovery-oriented care planning as an area we could improve on. And we were acutely aware of the challenges of achieving person-centered care in a forensic service where the legal restrictions can appear somewhat contradictory to the cause. And it was perhaps this inherent cognitive dissonance for us as mental health workers that motivated us to improve in this area. So in order to analyze the problem further, we did lots of talking 
uh, with lots of different people as a project team together with our MGT, with our patients, and also with stakeholders outside the service. And we use quality improvement methods to guide our exploration, process mapping, fishbone analysis, audit, freezer analysis to develop a theory of change. So in summary, what we found is no surprise was that our existing care planning process fell short in the ways we had imagined that our care planning was derived from a system designed primarily for our inpatient population and it was weighted more towards clinician determined treatment needs and it didn't serve the recovery needs of the specific cohort of community patients under our care. So we hypothesized that in order to drive improvement in this area, we needed to try and co-design a new approach to care planning with our patients. And we used a, a plan, do, study, act model of improvement to achieve the same. Uh, this involved a lot more talking uh, with various stakeholders, primarily our patients. And fundamental to improving the process, i.e. becoming more person-centered and recovery-oriented, was changing the way we engaged with and related to our patients. So to this end, patient reported outcome measures and experience measures were the vehicle for change, uh, as well as providing the scaffolding for our measurement plan. The measures themselves not only helped us to quantify improvement and measure the process, but they served to anchor the conversation with our patients about care planning from the patient's perspective. So arising from the various forums for stakeholder engagement and PDSA testing, we identified the Recovery Star as an acceptable and feasible person-centered care planning tool that we could use to generate personal recovery goals and treatment plans. And then we also used uh, another PROM and PREM, the Collaborate and Brief Inspire, to measure joint decision-making and recovery experience from the new care planning process. The Project measurement phase is still ongoing, but the indications from, from both the quantitative measures and the qualitative data so far are positive, heading in a positive direction. So very briefly, just to say uh, that uh, we've learned lots and lots throughout this uh, process, uh, a lot about QI theory and uh, QI tools and techniques, but it's actually the practical application of these methods that over time signal the real learning for us as a team. And, these were in the areas of uh, the people and the relationships that uh, we needed to develop, uh, our own attitudes and our work culture, and uh, the importance of teamwork uh, at the core of the QI process. So I'll hand over to Anne, uh, followed by Andy, and they'll talk a little bit more about our learning uh, through our efforts to scale the ladder of co-production and to engage with key stakeholders. So. Um Following um, the consultation, the feedback we got from um, all of the stakeholders was that the existing individual care plan was lengthy, it was not user friendly, it focused too much on treatment goals, there was no facility for evaluation and it was clinician led. So we sought an alternative to that and what we came up with was um, the recovery star. Just a little bit about the Recovery Star. It's very simple, easy to use. Um, it's focused heavily on recovery goals, and you can map your progress visually over time. But the most important thing for us is um, that it's patient-led. Um, so um, the, the Recovery Star is um, it's a holistic approach to looking after or, or working with um, our patients. As you can see, in, in the previous ICP we had, it was um, segregated into um, domains of physical health, mental health, substance use, self-care, things like check your blood sugars, take medication, remain abstinent and submit to drug screens, stuff like that. Our patients told us that these are not the things that were important to them. Embedded in the recovery story, we'll see that there's things like trust and hope identity, self-esteem, responsibility, social networks. These were the things that the patients, when they moved to the um, community, identified as being more important to them. The way in which we use the recovery star is very much patient-led. Um, Recovery and co-production are difficult concepts to actualize in forensic psychiatry, as Stephen has already said, and for many reasons. 
Um, it is a culture in which patients have much less agency and autonomy than the general population would have. But by using the recovery star, they are the ones that determine where on each of those spectrums in the star they sit. That provides the opportunity for us to open up conversations, say an example of which is, say, for um, on identity and self-esteem, they get themselves a five. We could sit down with them and we could talk to them about is, well, what is it that you need to do? What is it that you want to achieve? How are you going to do that? And how can we move this forward? Um, so it very much became led by them. The whole process became led by them. The big learning was, um, and the crucial change in the project, that, that we could easily um, change a document and we can change a process and how, like the process of how recovery, recovery goals were determined. But we couldn't necessarily guarantee that that would have a positive change for patient experience. We needed to change our way of thinking as well. We needed to be more focused on the relationship to address the power imbalance and provide conditions to support our patients towards exercising their own agency on autonomy as partners in the care and treatment process. The Recovery Star document provides a vehicle in which to anchor this, but it was important from our perspective that um, it was nothing about me without me. Um, and that the patients have to be involved in all stages um, of care planning and care treatment. I'm going to hand you over now to Andy. Thanks, Anne. I suppose the first thing in terms of our stakeholder engagement was to consult their own team. So we started having a, a series of MVP meetings and discussions. Um, not only this generates good ideas, but more importantly, I suppose, it added to the wider buy-in to our quality improvement uh, project. Uh, we also set up a number of focus groups to engage both uh, service users and staff. And um, these focus groups were run on the principles of co-production, as Anne already said, and were were actually chaired by an external um, expert in recovery principles and co-production. And I suppose these were very, very productive in terms of the information we, we got from them and the ideas uh, generated. Um, all these ideas and knowledge led to a series of uh, plan, do, study, act or PDSA cycles, which I suppose helped us to refine and test the quality improvement process. I suppose uh, just within the process of stakeholder engagement, the opportunity to engage with an external group. Uh, as I previously uh, mentioned, then our um, facilitator of our focus groups, um, Dr. Peter Byrne, he, he's a lead recovery educator in Arches Recovery College. Um, Peter, at the time, and the, the college he was involved in were also interested in uh, the care planning process and uh, were in the process of setting up a core production, core design group, um, basically to design um, a program for the college entitled Make the Most of Your Care Plan. So an invitation was given to myself to sit on that group, which uh, was uh, which was uh, accepted, obviously, and um, it, it really was uh, an education for myself in terms of just sitting on another group, seeing co-production in action, co-design uh, from an external agency, and certainly added ideas back and forth. So really, the, the, the learning from all this stakeholder engagement was really that doing with instead of doing for was central to everything we did. It did pose a challenge in a forensic mental health service, but the, the risk was definitely worth taking and, uh, in my opinion, had excellent results. Um, all the stakeholder engagement really did add to our knowledge bank and, um, I, I suppose, helped us with confidence and communication as we went along. and. Uh, so, and I suppose validated what we were doing in terms of quality improvement and generated new ideas. 
And last but not least, uh, I suppose the pride and achievement associated with, um, I suppose, number one, improving that process and making our patients' uh, recovery pathway more uh, recovery focused as such. And the feedback, that, finally, the feedback that we are getting uh, from patients is that um, they are, the, the, the whole, the recovery star in particular is much more user friendly for them and they do feel engaged more in the process, which was the aim, and they are satisfied. Um, you know, there, there, there's a sense of satisfaction, but the important thing is that the relationships are developing in a very different way where they are gaining, we've changed our thinking and they are gaining more agency and autonomy. So that's just a lovely thing to see. So that's the end of our presentation. Well, thank you all very much. That's really wonderful. And, and thank you for bearing with us and, and uh, the technical difficulties. Uh, you, you managed that very well. And I look forward to, to maybe we might have time for a question or two at the end. But uh, again, you should be so proud. I'm glad to see you've listed kind of pride in your achievement there because, uh, you know, it, it, it is another wonderful example of, of, of quality improvement uh, in in put into action. So well done. Thank you. Thank you. Last, but by no means least, uh, Rosemary, thank you for hanging on in there. And uh, it's a real pleasure to have you with us today as well. And uh, I'm going to hand over to you. You might just, again, just tell people a little bit about where you're coming from and uh, what yep. you do there. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you for having us on today, or for me, for having me on today. Um, I'm on my own today, but um, I wasn't on my own doing this project. Um, so I'm just going to start off and just my name is Rosemary Roach. And today I'm going to talk to you about our leadership and quality in healthcare project, which we undertook through the RCPI. To give some background on our project, we are a podiatry team based in CHO Area 2. Our team consists of Tina Clark, clinical specialist podiatrist, myself, Rosemary Roach and Katrina Rourke, both senior podiatrists. Our project was titled A Quality Improvement Initiative to Increase Patient-Centred, Efficient and Effective Care Through the Timely Provision of Footwear to Diabetic Foot Ulcer Patients. Foot ulcerations <clears throat> are most frequently recognised complication of diabetes, with an annual prevalence of 9.1 million to 26.1 million worldwide. After the resolution of a diabetic foot ulcer, approximately 40% of patients with diabetic foot ulcers experience a reoccurrence within one year after the ulcer heals. The aim of this initiative was to reduce the reoccurrence of ulcerations from 40% to 1% in CHO2, specifically in Network 9, Roscommon Community and Roscommon Network Hospital. We aim to do this by streamlining footwear referral and sanctioning processes and providing multidisciplinary assessment and footwear clinics, as well as developing a patient education programme, therefore improving efficiency, patient-centric care and treatment effectiveness. To assess the problem, we use a range of quality improvement methods and tools. Some of the baseline data collected is shown on the Patera chart on the screen. We use this as a way to view the various causes that contributed to the reoccurrence of a diabetic foot ulcer and we can visually see that the main reason for reoccurrence was that the patient had not received footwear on time. The other factors that caused diabetic foot ulcer were reoccurrence, uh, were non-compliance and deteriorating diagnosis. The process was analysed using a process map to visualise and gain accurate information on all steps taken from when a patient is referred to our department with a diabetic foot ulcer to the time they are fitted with footwear. We found it took 13 steps from referral to footwear fitting, and this took approximately 30 weeks. We used the fishbone diagram to explore and display possible causes of the reoccurrence of a diabetic foot ulcer. This really helped us understand the causes and that contributed to a reoccurrence of diabetic foot ulcer and helped us identify areas for improvement. We further utilise skills obtained from the course and use a di driver diagram to illustrate our drivers for change. These included staff, environment, management, leadership, an organisation, patients and families and improved processes. These sections could be further broken down into primary and secondary drivers that we use to help us achieve our goals. Communication is important to ensure stakeholders are fully informed and can reduce disruption to the project trajectory as well as establishing professional boundaries. We gain buy-in from all stakeholders for our project. We also identify blockers to successes, worked on ways to overcome these challenges by working collaboratively with all key individuals. Data obtained for our PDSAs carried out also helped us maintain support for change. We never want to in underestimate patient involvement and we included our patient in co-production and design. 
we held focus group meetings where all our service users were asked what they thought of our current service and then again post QI. One of our PDSAs was process testing. We used our process map to identify steps and quality changes we could make to speed up patients getting footwear. Through this, we were able to reduce the process from 13 steps down to seven, and we were able to get the provision of footwear reduced from 30 weeks to 10 without any extra financial cost to the service. Uh, we also created a digital referral system for the podiatry department and standardised the referral process, eliminating wait times for footwear sanctioning by sending the referral directly to the orthotics department. We made the referral on the first contact with podiatry as opposed to when the wound was healed. We also carried out joint podiatry and orthotics clinics, which allowed for shared knowledge and care of the patient. A new foot education leaflet is being used and one-on-one -on -one education sessions at each podiatry appointment, improving patient foot care and knowledge. The graph displays diabetic foot ulcer reoccurrences from June 21 to December 21 prior to QI implementation and from February 22 to August 22 after QI implementation. You can see there is a change in reoccurrence of diabetic foot ulcers since the implementation of our PDSAs. The graph beside that shows a number of weeks between first contact with podiatry service and the revision of bespoke footwear. Like the last graph, there is a difference between provision prior and post QI. A retrospective review of diabetic foot ulcer amputation in CHO2 was undertaken from January 21. The time between amputations is plotted on the graph. On the 31st of August 22, we had 255 days of amputation in our CHO area. We also carried out surveys with patients on their quality of life, diabetic foot care knowledge and service delivery pre and post QI. And you can see there was a major increase across all of these areas. We also carried out a staff survey on their knowledge and skills, MDT collaboration and service revision. And again, you can see the results were much improved post QI. So just to run through some of the um, benefits that we had, one of our main benefits was environmental benefits, which we felt uh, we wanted to discuss as it is uh, such a big factor in everyone's life at the moment. So emissions for the team related to travel for clinics decreased by 70% from January to August. Clinical waste was reduced by, for, by, for the department by 8,560, which was a potential saving of 55,640 per year. A digital referral system eliminated paper printing and postage further reducing carbon footprint. Social sustainability, this wasn't formally assessed, but it led to better working relationships between orthotists and podiatrists, which helped encourage collaboration and problem solving, having an impact on both teams. Improved quality of life for patients with less clinical appointments, reduction in hospital admissions with recurrent diabetic foot ulcers and better understanding of foot care prevention. And also uh, more appointments were made available for other clients to access the service. Financial benefits, uh, our clinical waste was reduced by 60% over eight weeks of the project. The digital referrals eliminated paper, printing and postage costs. However, that was not formally assessed. And there was also savings made in costs of footwear. Clinical outcome, there was a reduction in the reoccurrence of diabetic foot ulcers uh, during the project to zero by early referral and provision of footwear. Our amputation free days were 255 and patients had an improved knowledge of foot care, avoiding adverse effects of diabetic foot disease. So the future. So I suppose spread is the main thing. Already the referral form has been adopted in the wider CHO2 area. We found that small changes have made a huge positive impact, which can be replicated nationally. And we feel that this project has highlighted the need for investment and recruitment of orthotists nationwide. And carbon footprint, we need to consider how our operations can reduce carbon footprint and we've shown how small changes can have a significant impact. So we learned so much from the RCPI. They were so helpful and we gained some quality improvement tools through our course that allowed to, for both the success of this project and that we can take into the future in our service. We now have confidence in communicating with stakeholders, which allows us to bring change. And we can now see that networking and promoting quality improvement projects can lead to an appetite for change within the service. And I suppose, like everyone else said, we're really proud of ourselves for being able to achieve this. And um, we can see the difference it makes most importantly for our patients. That's kind of an overview of our project. Um, Katrina and Tina weren't able to come on today, but um, it really was a team effort. And I think that's one of the main things going from something like this, if you are implementing quality improvement, you need to be able to work as a team and listen to each other. And I think we were really good at that. Well, thanks so much, Rosemary. That was amazing. Um, and and uh, so much in there again, and, and, and uh, so many different things that you were able to improve together. I think that that's one of the 
you know, I suppose the, the goals kind of uh, is to how do you kind of tick as many of those quality features, you know, uh, including things like sustainability and, and environmental impact. So uh, really another a wonderful example. And I think just looking at the three projects together, I mean, the diversity and the scope of what uh, people have been doing is amazing. But uh, again, the thing I suppose that, that, that uh, uh, strikes me is, again, how the methodology and the approach is adaptable to, you know, different environments, different types of projects. And, um, um, you know, and again, it's, it's I suppose, uh, one of the big words that's coming through to me is, again, collaboration, co-production relationships, you know, and, and uh, I suppose that this course is born out of a, a, a really great relationship that we've had between the, the, the Royal College of Physicians and the uh, Quality and Patient Safety uh, uh, Directors, you know, so it's it's been a very important kind of relationship ourselves, but um, maybe just, I, I'll throw it out there to you as a group, you know, I mean, what do you think was that the most important thing about bringing methods like co-production or collaboration together and, and uh, uh, anybody want to to pick up on that one first? And I appreciate Stephen and, and Andy and, and Anne, you may be there still on the phone. Yes, we are. Suppose it allows for the success of the project if, if all the stakeholders are on the same page. So things like having your PDSAs and other tools that are, I suppose, quantifiable and that they help prove to stakeholders, maybe people in management and that, that there can be real uh, improvement made across the service. I think yeah. Asking, yeah. I think um, asking the patient what matters most to them, you're hearing the patient voice and that lived experience of the journey of diabetes for them. And I think um, they are the people that are best placed to tell us where change needs to happen because we're sometimes doing the same thing every day and we're not looking at the bigger picture maybe as what it's like for the patient that's coming through and what each step looks like and feels like for them. So I think the value of hearing the patient's voice is very important. And that's the best part of co-production, I think. Yeah, and that, that idea of, of what matters to you, uh, you know, uh, been, been brought to the fore. I love that that uh, that line I think you guys had, which, which is, you know, your voice matters as much as your blood sugar. Um, you know, that that's really important, you know, that, that, that you wanted... Uh, you know, it wasn't just about, you know, measuring your blood sugar. It was hearing what people wanted and needed. Um, any, Stephen and Anne and Andy, any, any, any kind of final thoughts on co-production or? Yeah, I think just to, to say that it's, um, it's something that you, you have to try hard at. I think over the course of a project, it was uh, uh, an evolution in terms of uh, our mindset about uh, care planning and actually what co-production meant. Um, so, and it's still a, a process, and I think it's something you have to work hard at. But that's, I guess, uh, that's what relationships are like in general. You have to work at them. Yeah, and I think that's that 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 kind of is is, is important, isn't it? That that quality improvement learning isn't isn't a quick fix, or you know, it, it's not an instant solution to anything. But it's it's just a way, I suppose, of of working, and you still have to do the work and put the time in, but. I suppose you're more likely to to be successful. I think using using these approaches. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the things again, I was struck by kind of I think it was Alison was saying it or, or Marisa again, just just you you know not all PDSAs are successful, and I think you know some of the that the, the the PDSAs that you did didn't work out, but. The key thing is is can you learn from them, and I think that that's a, a critical thing, you know. Uh, what about the use of PDSA? I mean, did, did 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 it kind of get a bit demystified as time went on, and 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 just the practicality would become more evident? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think we saw the value of PDSA very early on because we were struggling to know where to start. So we used our first PDSA as a starting point, and once we saw the change or the small little change that happened and the results, that was reassuring for us that we were on the right path. So I think then by adapting and using various PDSAs, it was like we were getting reassurance as we went along that we were going in the right direction because our tests and our predictions were going in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it was very reassuring for us to be able to see it and then to be able to plot it on the run chart to see actually it put the PDSAs into a visual so that we weren't just saying that last one was good and the next one might, we could actually plot them and see, see the progress that way. So it's lovely to have a visual reassurance of the practical things that you're doing in clinical practice. Yeah, and some of the things yeah, that, great. Work that didn't work, so it was an excellent model. It offers a great framework. 
Yeah, yeah, and again, it's, it's simplicity kind of you know exactly. betrays kind of how much it, it can bring. And and uh, again, another tool kind of I suppose of improvement and you know part of let's say the framework for improving quality from the HSC. Uh, I, I was really impressed, Rosemary. Your your run charts, uh, you know, and 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 the data you were able to to capture. I, I think that was probably very important to to your project. Yeah, um, it definitely, I suppose, being able to prove that we were making a change um, it was, was brilliant and it was good for us as well. It was a real sense of achievement. And like I said, like, obviously, it was brilliant to be able to help those people to prevent reoccurrence from happening. But it also, you know, by doing this, we were able to free up other appointments to see people who were kind of being missed. And I suppose from our model of care for diabetes, you know, that there's the moderate and the high risk patients. And if we were spending all our time seeing recurrent wounds, the moderate risk are getting pushed further and further out. So eventually they become high or become uh, an ulcer patient as well. So we were trying to free up those lots to prevent that happening further down the road. So it has massive, you know, um, impact further on down the line. Well, look, uh, you know, again, fantastic work. Uh, congratulations to all uh, of, of the projects. And again, we, we had, I suppose, uh, you know, 20 or so projects through this year. Um, and I must say that the standard was was excellent across the board. But we really liked, I think, the things that you were doing. And I think uh, the diversity uh, is, is just super. I see Cloda. Are you, can you hear us there, Cloda? Are you on? Hello. You can hear us there. I was oh. just going to give you the last word if you want to, to you know, to, to to maybe kind of share some of your 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 uh, your learning from the the experience. That's very kind, and but thank you for your patience and for allowing me to join a little bit late. I'm sure I agree with everything Alison and Marisa said. It has been such a learning curve. But in, if I was to reflect back on it, the one thing I would say, and it follows on from your points about the TDSA, is. If we were to do it again, I think we would just start the PDSA sooner. I think we had this fear of the PDSAs, but actually once we got into the swing of it and had the weekly graph that Alison was talking about, we had something concrete that we could explore together and bring back to our team at our weekly meeting. And I think that really helped to bring about a culture change um, and help demystify the person-centeredness piece that we were trying to explore. Um, and, and hopefully that... Uh, Hopefully that worked and hopefully we can continue it. And look, uh, much thanks to everybody in the CPI and the National QPS um, for facilitating this. It was a great learning experience for us and hopefully we'll continue it. Oh, that, that's very kind, Claude. Thank you. And, and yeah, it's a lovely point. I mean, I think, I think you know, start before you're ready is something uh, I was taught once by colleagues in, in, in Cincinnati Children's Hospital and, and uh, you know, you know, make make it easy just to start and get going because that's when the real learning starts to happen. So, uh, folks, it's been a real pleasure. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out and joining us today and going to the trouble of of, of uh, presenting. Uh, I think people will agree uh, it's been a, a great example of of, of quality improvement uh, learning put into making things uh, better. So, uh, thank you all. Um, folks, just to close out quickly, just again a. a, a Quick kind of mention of our, our the, the Oxford Handbook of Patient Safety. Um, uh, if people are interested in a very practical book, uh, be really make a good re really good Christmas present. If you're struggling to find kind of uh, something for the people uh, at work, you can you can give them this for Christmas. Um, and uh, again, really encourage people to get yourselves on the map, uh, the QPS uh, Ireland Network map. Uh, there's a link there, so please do join up. Uh, it lets everybody uh, know where you are, what you do, what your interests are, and it allows other people to find you. And there was lots of talk today about collaboration and relationships, and I think this is a critical element of that, so please please do join up. Uh, and another, again, kind of source of relationships is the Q community there. Uh, so again, if you want to contact our, our colleague, uh, Caroline lennon um, uh, to find out more, but again, we'd really encourage people to to join up Q, and again, that not only connects across Ireland, but also Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. And yeah, so speaking uh, of the colleagues in Northern Ireland, so uh, our next QPS uh, talk time is in uh, uh, three weeks time, actually it's on the 13th of, of, of December, um, and uh, we will be uh, joined on that occasion by our wonderful colleague, Levette Lam uh, from HSCQI in Northern Ireland. And she'll be talking about the, the new Northern Ireland strategy 2022 to 2024. 
for um, uh, health and social care quality improvement. So I think that'll be really interesting because I think uh, we have a lot of uh, shared challenges and I think it'll be great to hear from them uh, on the 13th of December. And then just a reminder for people, the, uh, the International Forum Quality and Safety in Healthcare will be in Copenhagen next year and there is a call out for, for posters. So we'd really encourage people to get your posters in um, and uh, that has to be done before the 7th of December. So uh, get your posters in and then uh, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll, uh, some of us will get to, to travel there if that's possible and uh, it'd be good to see many people there. And then finally, like I said earlier, you'll get a, a short uh, pop-up just uh, to, to uh, ask for your thoughts on the, the session today. Please do fill it out. Please give us your feedback. We do act on that. And you can email our colleague, Chris Kavanagh, uh, if you have any questions. And finally, I really have to thank and welcome Chris to our team um, and, and thank Juanita uh, and Noemi, who've been working tirelessly in the background um, and our colleague, Stephen, uh, as well who uh, do all the hard work in bringing the session uh, that we've had today together. So thank you all. And we will see you in a few weeks time on December the 13th. Um, thank you very much. Bye-bye.